My name is Debbie Forster. I'm the CEO of the Tech Talent Charter. I'm here to represent. You are the CEO of TTC. For those who haven't heard of it, can you please explain what TTC does and why it exists? Let's start with why it exists. People probably noticed that tech um, in and of itself as a workforce is not terribly diverse. And that needs to get fixed, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's smart business. So the Tech Talent Charter exists to ensure that we bring together the ecosystem. So no one is reinventing the wheel. We connect the dots and so no one has to reinvent the wheel. We focus on what is practical. Companies talk about what's working and not working and collaborate as a sector to try and attract people from all backgrounds to come and be in tech. How was the Tech Talent Charter founded? It started as a side gig, like many of these organizations, on top of people's day jobs back in 2015, 2016, and, in, and I was part of that founding group. Back in then, in 2017, I leaned forward in a moment of either insanity or genius, I'm not sure which. We became a formal organization in 2017, came to the attention of government, you may remember 2017 was the year of gender pay reporting, Me Too and Harvey Weinstein. So there was a whole lot of companies woke and scared. I firmly believe in Churchill's never waste a good crisis. So we already had 17 companies ready to show what the art of the possible was. So government notice gave us a bit of seed funding. By Christmas, we were 100 signatories. If you roll forward now five years, we're over 700 signatories across the whole of the UK. Brands you recognize, you know, some obvious ones, Microsoft, Salesforce, Cisco, but we have Lloyds Bank, we have Sky TV, we have PwC, we have Domino's Pizza, um, Cancer Research UK. So it's any organization of any size who is a tech employer. And I think that's what people often forget is how many companies. I always joke that maybe there's some company out there that doesn't need us, but I've not met them yet. Companies of all sizes have woke to realize they need a strong tech staff and they need a diverse one. And so that's really where we exist. You were once a teacher. Can you tell us about how you transitioned into tech? So I came over here back in 1990 and I was a teacher. I was an English teacher with a funny accent, right? And I began working in schools, but that was the 90s. And so like many women, I fell into tech. I used a computer in the 90s. And if you were a teacher and used a computer in the 90s, you pretty soon got in charge of IT, all right? And that move on up forward as I became a deputy head, there was a point in which I was overseeing not just the teaching of IT, our computer network, to which my supportive brother asked me, what did the monkey die of? They let me get that job. But I learned, you know, I rolled up my sleeves. I learned to ask questions and be stubborn and learn about tech. So from the 90s on, I was being pulled more and more into running technology, teaching tech, and I liked it back then. Back then, what tech did really interest young people in a way that other subjects weren't. And what I liked for my kids was tech open doors they wouldn't normally get through. You know, that was, we talk about that, that golden ticket. I knew my kids, whatever their background, if we could get them into tech, they could go anywhere, be anything. But in the, you know, as we moved towards the noughties, it started becoming very, very clear. The boys were elbowing their way in to be at the keyboard and the girls were moving their way back. So I found myself, and I say that a lot of times, I found myself, and I think as women, I've got to start correcting myself on that and be more deliberate and mindful and stop apologizing for where we are. So I became more and more involved in girls in the tech. You know, why aren't they there? What's happening? Some of the research. I became part of, I was one of the first schools to adopt when I was a deputy and then when I was a head teacher. Um, uh, computer clubs for girls, which was really looking at without just pinkifying things. I usually hate that when they used to say, let's get girls into tech, let's make it pink and let them just design fashion. Rubbish. It was about finding projects, letting girls see how tech was, letting them have the computer first rather than get pushed to the back. That pulled me into a lot of discussions increasingly where I was working with big companies like Microsoft and BT, working with people from government. 
the organization at the time, which was the IT sector group working with government and big business, asked me to come and work with me with them as a head teacher. So I began looking at that. Why are the barriers? How do we help? Because big business, even back in the noughties, was saying we want more people in tech, more women in tech. Realize after two years, policy is not my first love. I like getting my hands dirty. So then came across a startup at the time called Apps for Good, started by someone called Ira Sapinski. This was putting kids as young as 10 in teams, letting them choose any project they cared about and learn how to go from problem to prototype to market. So we had kids as young as 10 getting apps on the market. And, you know, in joining that, because I still spoke fluent educationese, I knew that would take off in companies. So when I joined, in a moment of excitement, people were saying to me, you're bored in your job, you love this thing, go talk to her. I talked to her and said, if you want to give me a call, I'd, I'd love to work with you. Gave up my job, sat down with her, and then had an, oh God, you've only done this in two schools. This was my first taste of startup. So I got in my car, I got on Twitter, and we went from two schools to 100 schools to five years later, we had reached 75,000 young people. We were pilots in Spain and Portugal and the US. And really seeing, I think at that time, 50% of our young people, 50% of those 75,000 young people were girls. And the model was based on tech experts mentoring teams. And 40% of our tech mentors were girls. Now we both know, we're women, we both know 40%, 50% and tech is not what you hear. So I began to become more involved and someone called Sinead Bunting had a group of us together. There may have been a few glasses of wine and she was really inspired to write something called the Tech Talent Charter because she wanted to get women into tech. She was tired of seeing the messing about. I may have over said glasses of wine, said if I have to go to one more round table event on why there's no women in tech, my head's going to explode. And if I go to one more company that's reinventing the same damn wheel, I'm going to start telling the truth and getting in trouble. So as long as we don't do that, I'm in. And that's the way I found myself into being the tech talent charter. 41% of our community are career switchers. What advice do you have for any woman just starting out without any previous tech experience? Stop apologizing for yourself and know your value. What you're doing and bringing in is that rich life experience, that knowledge of the workplace, the knowledge of how the world works, that your difference is actually not a liability, it is a strength. It's also to realize that, that coming into software engineering, coming into tech, is not knowing all the answers. It's not being able to get everything perfect, right? Quite the opposite. It's what we, we've said before. This is about knowing to ask the right questions, knowing to go know where to get to find a solution, knowing who to ask. And so it's the kind of things that actually, as women, as non-binary, as humans, we're very good at. And so that, thing that we told ourselves would make us rubbish at tech becomes your superpower. And so companies and, you know, not all companies are going to get it. Cool. Don't go to them. There's hundreds of other companies that will. So if you, if you do unfortunately find that one company that isn't right and it is trying to turn you into that square pig to, to fit in the square hole, walk away because there's another company that loves exactly the shape of the peg that you are and will build the whole round to fit you. And so go in bold, go in bravely, not fearlessly. Because uh, when we tell ourselves to be fearless, that means we don't have fear. Actually be, if, if you're not scared, then you're not being brave. You know, I'm not, I'm not being brave drinking a cup of tea because I'm not scared of having that cup of tea. Being brave is doing something while you're scared, doing something while you're afraid that you might fail. And know that in tech, Fail is a necessary point. I remember someone telling, saying to me really early, if you haven't failed at least once, you're not stretching, you're not growing. Tech is, that was a fail. That's a thing. That's not you. You're not a failure. That's a thing. And then you have verbs. You can do. What do you do next? 
What do you do to rethink your code? What do you do to look online and find on GitHub? What can you do to fix that? How do you work with colleagues to solve that problem? And that's what we do. Have you had any experience of personal failure in your profession? And how have you brought yourself back up from that? I think time and time again, and, and depending on how you view yourself, you can let a little thing feel a big failure, all right, that you then look back on and it didn't work at all. I have made huge mistakes in front of a large group of people. I have told and taken an organization in the wrong direction. I have taken wrong jobs where it doesn't fit. I have hired as a boss. I have hired people that we both look at each other later and go, that was a big mistake. And I think I just, I get, and I, you know, I, I thank my dad. You know, it's it, when we talk about this piece of women feeling empowered, the, the men aren't always the bad guys. My dad was the guy when I'd make that mistake or have that problem, or I can remember the first time when I was 14, we moved to a new state. I had always been one of the top students, right? So I learning was easy. I went to this tiny town where I sat in a class and I, I was the only person in the room, as far as I could tell, that didn't know how to do something. And there was, a, there was a terrible teaching exercise where each person had to go to the board and stand in front of the board and try to do it. And I just couldn't. The first day, in my first day in this school, I stood at this board for a few minutes and they just said, Debbie, you can sit down. It was mortifying. And I remember going home in tears to my dad and my dad just saying, well, it's best you learn this now. Best time to learn it is now where we're here. You and I can do this every night. And by God, I learned how to do that geometry. And a month later, I could go and stand at that board. But I'm glad I did that because I do know of kids, of people that don't have that first big fail until they're off at university and there's no one to wrap around them, till that first job. And it's, it's until you have that first, oh God, I have no idea to do this. And there are literally, there are people looking at you. It's not even I had to pretend myself. I was the front of the room with a piece of chalk at the board. Everybody saw me fail. But learning that at 14, going home crying, and then you know not wanting to go back, and dad saying, you're gonna have to go back. But dad, I don't know yet. You're just gonna have to go back, get through it, and then you will. And my God, that first time I stood at the board and was able to do it, and as I sat down, him saying, well done, Debbie, was one of the sweetest moments in my entire high, you know, school career. Much better than any other A-plus I got in any other class because it had been so damn hard. You have delivered talks on leadership. What are your biggest takeaways when you deliver this talk? I think the biggest thing is I, in, in talking and listening to other talks in leadership, I think it's vitally important that we step away that there is one way to be a leader, okay? That this is what leaders do. No, because I've seen great leaders who do it and those who don't. And it is about, it's, there's that term about being authentic and authentic leadership. And it is often misused. It's not as if I bring all my rubbish of the day and spill it out on my team every day. But I think a story, when I first, I became a head teacher very young. I was a head teacher of a, of a large secondary school at 37. If I could go back and tell myself, I'd say, wait a couple of years, but I did that. And my old boss, who was a woman, said to me as I was leaving, um, oh, right, so, so Debbie, I, uh, if they're gonna take you seriously, I wouldn't go by the name Debbie. Your, your formal name is Deborah. So I would suggest when you do this, go in as Deborah. And I thought she was clever and a good leader, so I did. And the problem was, as I was a head teacher in that first month, whenever people would come in and say Deborah, the fact is I was only ever called Deborah when I was in trouble and my parents were telling me off. So internally, every time people came in to talk to me and say, Deborah, I was flinching inside of, oh God, what? Until I had to realize, I'm not Deborah, I'm Debbie. And being a young head, and being a young head when most heads were men, were in their 50s and all those sorts of things, I did fall in a lot to feeling I had to adopt and be that kind of head, that kind of leader. And I did it and I could do it and I was reasonably successful and it nearly killed me. And my takeaway was, it is better to figure out what's authentic to me and how I express frustration or disapproval or praise and can bring myself. So I talk about bringing my whole self. I do still have days where I have to put game face, right? I do need to be professional, but that professional can mean that I bring 
if I'm hurt, if I'm confused, if I ask for help. And the more I'm able to bring my authentic self into my job, the more people respond to me and the more I'm able to take on his leadership. And I'm also modeling to everyone else that professional authentic self. And so it is knowing you're going to make mistakes. It is knowing that you need to ask, ask for help at times or ask for advice. It is knowing you're going to get it wrong. And the best leaders are the ones who can say, I made a mistake. I got it wrong. I'm sorry. Here's what we're going to do. So I think, you know, whenever I'm coaching or mentoring people or talking about leadership, it is, I can tell you some things that work for me, but you need to look at it. And it's like a suit of clothes. Some of them are going to suit you and some of them aren't. Some of them are going to be colors that look fabulous on me and look terrible on you. It's being willing to try, realizing that being a leader is a set of tools and skills that can be learned. All right. This great leaders are born rubbish. Great leaders learn. It is a craft that you can learn through practice, trial and error, because there will be error and, and determination to just keep moving forward. Oh, and as women, don't wait until you completely feel you're ready to be a leader because it's too late. Learn to be, to reach in. My best thing I've learned is that, remember we, I, I mentioned earlier that being brave. Do it while I'm still kind of scared. I'm at my best when I take on a new project, a new role that quietly, faintly terrifies me and working through that fear. Has anything surprised you about being a CEO? I think, and, and I'm not stating an original thought. I remember listening to a thing where President Obama said this. It's each time you move up to the next bigger table, you realize it's the same kind of people around the table, right? You know, I, I think often as women, we walk in very intimidated. Oh God, I go to lots of things where I put myself into a new leadership situation. And my first go-to th feeling is that, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, go to the table, but just don't spill anything. Okay, just make sure you don't spill anything on anyone. But then as you listen, it's important to listen before speaking. That next thing is, whatever the level, whatever the table, however much you're, you're moving up in the world, whatever that means, people are people, the problems are the same. All right, and so I think that's what surprises me. Each time I step up or into another arena that I'm scared of, because scary is good, um, I look around and listen. And yes, there's new things for me to learn, but then you strip it away. People are people, problems are problems. And sometimes the most valuable thing I love, and I've had times people work, oh my God, that's amazing. If you want to sound really clever in the middle of a big thing, is to ask that question. So what is the problem we're trying to solve here? rocks them on their boats. Okay. That is, you know, sometimes the best thing about being a leader when you're struggling with something is to go back to those first principles. So yeah, that's a surprise is each time I step into a new place where I think, Oh God, this is the one where you get found out. Debbie is to walk on and to realize people are people and just learn to write, listen and ask the right questions. What advice would you give to any woman facing imposter syndrome? is one of part of my portfolio. I coach and mentor a lot of women. And so the one thing they all have, myself included, is that that daily battle with imposter syndrome. But I think I think we need to change our relationship with that imposter syndrome. That little whispering voice is just that, a little whispering voice. It's not reality. And in fact, sometimes that, you know, if I look at the stereotype of the big entrepreneur, I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur, a startup god, they could do with a little more doubt. They could do with a few more questions. So as long as I, I, I joke about when you're thinking about your imposter syndrome, one, it's realizing it is not true. And don't beat yourself up if you can't get rid of it. Just move it out of the driver's seat. Put it in the back seat. You know, I do a daily tango with my imposter syndrome at 56. So it's a long time. But what I've realized is she sits in the back seat. She's not in the navigation. She doesn't ride shotgun and she doesn't drive. And as long as she stays in the back and mostly behaves herself, we're, we're fine and we roll forward. What advice would you give women trying to balance family commitments, studying, upskilling, etc., with a career in tech? Stop trying to be perfect. Okay. I, I became a head teacher. We moved house and I had a daughter who was three years old and I had a partner that gave 50, 50, but it did just mean we were both equally exhausted most of the time. So 
be braver about yourself ask for help where you can and abandon that pretense of perfection perfect mob perfect thing is because that's going to kill you quicker than anything else and it is understanding there was a point as a working mother where I came in once and started to sit down next to my daughter to watch telly and I started to jump up and said, oh, the dishes haven't done the dishes. And my three-year-old reaches over and goes, oh, mommy, sit, sit. You always jump up to do something. So that is that moment when you realize always keep in your head and never apologize for what is important to you. And that is balancing. Don't apologize that your career is point to, important to you. Don't apologize that your children are important to you. Don't apologize that you want to be a good partner. And allow imperfections. Allow slow down. And also, you know that, oh, we can have it all. We can, and it can kill us. You don't have to have it all at once. Give yourself permission to take time to do what matters for you. I, you know, if I could go back and talk to myself, I would, I probably wouldn't have listened. I was very stubborn, but I wish I could have convinced myself this is a marathon, not a sprint and pace ourselves. Those of us that are mothers, etc. And you'll regret more the time you didn't have with your kids than you did for that meeting you didn't show up for or that extra networking event you didn't do. But also, my daughter is really proud of who I was at business. So, and actually some of her best memories did happen at nursery. And I taught my daughter how to be a strong woman. So don't apologize when you do want to go to that networking event. It's a balancing act and balancing means shifting and balancing means you fall off sometimes and you can get. What would you say to those who say that the problem of women in tech is fixed? I think the politest way I can put it is that's rubbish. All right, that we are in the foothills. We have not climbed the mountain. There is progress being made, but actually, you know, when I look at gender, it's, we're getting better at training. We're getting better at recruiting and onboarding. We're not there as companies for retaining and growing women and growing women into leadership. And I think that is something as, as the Tech Talent Charter we're going to really raise that banner and offer challenge to our signatories about that. Some companies are getting really good at that, but it is not enough just to get women in the door. We've got to keep them, grow them, promote them, or this is not going to work. And this is what's happening. I think we're, we're turning the, the taps on in full, but we're not noticing that the bathtub, the plug's not in. We're losing them. They're going out. And so, and this is why it's vitally important that companies get their culture right that they think very consciously about training, about promotion and removing bias, working with their middle managers. So there are all the pieces of the solution there, but I don't of all of my 700 signatories and none of them, I promise you, will come back and tell me I'm wrong. None of them have put all of the pieces of the puzzle together and they're not fully collaborating. And until that happens, we have to keep going. And, and to go to the Ada Lovelace Institute, my comment is this, some companies in the last few years have got complacent in that sense of we think it's fixed and they have a lot of people doing this in an unfunded, unrecognized way on the side desk project. And what happens when a recession comes in, what happens when companies downsize, the side project falls off. And so I'm already hearing from some of my companies, we can't do it this year. We're dialing it down. I'm hearing companies that said we had five people doing this. We have one person doing this. This is an on, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And those companies that did the first 50 meters, 100 meters are going, woo, we win. I got bad news. It's a marathon. Get back on, put your trainers back on and start running because we're not done. If you could share one word of wisdom to your younger self, what would it be? It brings all that together. Be gentler and kinder to myself. Be as kind and gentle and supportive of myself as I am of anyone else around me. Remind myself, I've got this, I can do this. Not listen to that internal, you know, imposter syndrome. Learn when to stop, learn my limits, get the rest, learn to say no. Stop being such a damn people pleaser. Do what I know is right for me and those around me, not what I think will make people happier, make them whoever the hell they are. 
like me more. Figure out how I can like myself and be gentler to myself.